Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Honey, and I am a grateful recovering member of Al-Anon and Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, normally I front end because, but I'm a little fatutzed. Um, <laughs> anyhow, um, thank you, Dan. Uh, okay, um, I am, I've been asked here to uh, be of some use, and um, as I often say, oh, this is so not about you, um, that, uh, you know, this is, uh, one of those conferences where the gay and lesbian, bisexual and transgender and questioning community come together um, in a place which asks, has always asked me to be a little more grown up. And uh, being grown up is not one of those things that, you know, I came ready to do when I got here. I just knew that um, when I, I moved from New York, I grew up in New York City first and then uh, the suburbs of New York um, in the 60s and the 70s. And I, I always like to uh, start this share by saying, you know, growing up with the Mill and Jim show, my parents, um, was kind of like growing up in a Norman Lear production of the hybriding of Long Day's Journey and Tonight with a little bit of Boys in the Band and a lot of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, they, they afforded us a lot of really great opportunities educationally, and they gave, you know, like my sponsor just said to me, you know, it doesn't really get to you to stand up in front of people and talk about things, but getting real about things can, can uh, you know, that's not what I came equipped with. Uh, I came to these rooms by way of moving to Boston when I was on a geographic um, to uh, to Boston to see if I could have a you know a cute new start instead of you know living where I grew up and and having something else happen uh, that was more of the same and uh, but I connected with this guy that uh, we sort of knew each other at a distance from from um, Larchmont, New York, and and uh, he started talking about growing up in alcoholic family. And, um, you know, over the years, I came in here because of, you know, I thought it was about my family. I thought it was about my parents. But when I got here and spent some time here with you, I realized that it's about, more importantly, what about me? And, and, and there were all these tools that were given to me uh, when Michael brought me to this Mass General gargantuan Saturday morning Al-Anon meeting uh, at the end of Charles Street in Boston um, that, you know, it was like, oh, my God, I, I totally understand what they're talking about. I, you know, I, I started to understand, you know, where my clumsiness was. You know, I, I just I felt very unsure of myself. Um, I didn't have a strong center. I was always sort of told to be somehow, some way, somewhere, like completely contradictory to the way I felt about um, how I, how I, you know, how <laughs> how I was. And um, there was no such thing as talking about the way we felt about things. There was always the prescribed formula of how it was supposed to be. And oftentimes it was at the other end of a harangue um, of somebody else's want. And, you know, my sponsor tells me the story about being in an ice cream store, and I think it's so perfect for this particular thing. She was there uh, waiting to get a a serving, and and, um, this mother and daughter were in there. This little girl and her mom were in there. And the little girl wanted to have, you know, like peanut butter chocolate Rocky Road or something, and her mother said, no, you're going to have vanilla. And I was like, oh, I know what that is. I, you know, I I, I wanted to, you know, here I was in a place where 
you know, th there were all these things afforded to me. I was in this ice cream parlor, and yet I wasn't allowed to have any of those choices. I was always given this. You know, like I was always, uh, I, when I was heading off to college, I remember I really wanted to go to theater school, and, and um, my uh, father was like, no, you're going to do a professional choice. You'll never make any money doing that. And... Um, <laughs> Turns out I don't even do the professional choice path either. So, you know, it's a lot of good that did me. Um, but, it w you know, as I said, they did afford me some wonderful opportunities in education and travel. And, you know, my mother always used to say, well, you know, an education should make you at least interesting dinner conversation. And, 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 and that's kind of the way it, it was. There were, you know, there were a lot of uh, um, wonderful things. But there was a lot of, uh, you know, knock my pins out from under me kinds of things that happened. You know, I can remember one night as a, li a really little kid, and we lived in a, a house where my parents' room was like at one end of the house, and us kids were at the other end of the house, and there was this massive fight going on between them. And I woke up, it's like four in the morning, and it had, I guess, really been going on for a while. And I walk into their room, and, they sa and I said, well, what's wrong? And they both whipped around at me and said, nothing. <laughs> and I was like, all of my capacity to perceive anything in the world, like the, my worldview was totally jacked up because there was obviously this uproar going on at the end of the hall. And, and yet the grown-ups told me nothing was going on. And so I, I looked at life very confusedly, and not the least of which was... Um, and, you know, you'll, I'll flesh this out a little bit longer, but, you know, as a little gay kid, I had so many different levels of compartments that I had to operate in. I had to be a good little Boy Scout, and I had to be a good little altar boy. I had to be a good student. And, and the back story was like, you know, we, well, the front story was all this lace curtain Irish stuff, and, but the back story was crazy alcoholism. And so uh, that, that piece about sectioning myself off um, started to get really hard for me to integrate. And, I, and so when I did uh, start becoming friends with Michael G., um, and we started talking about growing up in alcoholism, and especially in this town that we grew up in, which was like, you know, there, the street that my parents had, our, had us live on, one end was this big drinky club, and the other end was Joan White's house. And so Joan White had this mint green suicide door continental, and she'd come bombing up Woodbine Avenue from the club after a lunch. And there was like a phone tree that started at the front desk at the club. Get the kids out of the leaf piles. Joan's heading home. And, and so there was like kind of all this glamour, but then all of this like crazy jacked up behavior. And, um, and you know, it just sort of to set little environmental stuff, you know, and it normalized drinking to me. So guess what? At the age of eight, I had a drink and started to engage in all kinds of secretive, self-destructive behavior that wasn't quite so obvious to anybody else because I had learned how to secret things away. I had learned how to have not just a double life, but multiple lives. And um, so consequently, by the time I turned 16, I, you know, was very aware that I was queer and, and uh, had been getting fag bashed up until the time I beat up Eddie O'Connor at the age of 13 after a catechism class. Um, <laughs> no opinion on outside issues. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so the, uh, you know, um, I found my way down to, you know, I was 16 years old and then, you know, little preppy kid walking into the spike down in the lower west side of Manhattan with a half a fifth under my, under my belt and an eight ball in my pocket and found the hottest pizza throwing, carburetor fixing Italian guy from Brooklyn <laughs> to have at it with. And he loved that a 16 year old boy was into him. And, um, you know, so, you know, there I was engaging in all kinds of risky behavior. That was risky. That was, you know, I was 
a naive child, you know, putting out this face that, um, you know, I think codependence really makes me do that. You know, I don't want you to know back here, there's this shadow full of secrets back here, but this is what I'm going to give you. When in actuality, if I wanted to engage, and, and really what I do here in Al-Anon is to, figure, is to learn what God wants for me, my God wants for me in my relationships, and, um, and, and how I feel comfortable in my relationships, not being denied the rocky road because someone else wants me to have the vanilla, but what I want to have happen. What, more importantly, what about me? in this situation? How am I going to cause peace and, and genuineness in my experience of life? And uh, so, you know, over time, there I am working with this amazing al -Anon. By the way, when I got to al -Anon, it was like sponsorship. Ew, letting somebody know, letting someone in. You know, that, you know I, I don't even do that with boyfriends who I'm supposedly wanting intimacy with. So why would I do it with a sponsor? But, you know, it's interesting. Again, this conflicted, paradoxical nature of codependency in me. I, I, I come to the rooms because my mother qualifies me. I come to the rooms because I'm in agony over the AIDS epidemic happening. I come to the rooms because of so many things. So and, and who is always there but the women? So men, your sisters are here for you. And women, your brothers are here for you. And if they're not, then they don't need to be. So um, what do I do? I find an Al-Anon sponsor who is the wife of a, an amazing, sober Boston Irish fireman who um, <laughs> she says, when I finish securing that he was my qualifier, I realized that I married him because I was there too. And that was profound for me. And, um, you know, Rose took me through the steps. And by the end of my fifth step, just as an aside, uh, well, not as an aside, but um, at the end of my fifth step, she said, and now you might consider how you drink. And you see, in al we don't do that. <laughs> but... <laughs> But Rose, O oh, apostrophe F, did. <laughs> and, and for that reason, I'm very grateful for and hold her memory because after um, being in Al Anon for about 45, 46 years, um, she closed her life circle and uh, went with Frank. And uh, she uh, was a miracle in my life, you know. And when we talk about the step work, that um, I what, that I did with her, I there wasn't all of this. None of this stuff was published when I started seeing her. My serenity date is the end, May twenty seventh, nineteen eighty seven, and um, so we worked out of the big book in the twelve and twelve. And so when we would do things, when we would be reading out of the tw big book in the twelve and twelve, when we got to drinking, we always plugged in the alcoholic, people, places, and things, and thinking. And when we got to the alcoholic, it was usually, you know, when there, there would be something about the alcoholic, there would be this term called co-alcoholic. And so um, she uh, really taught me how to be way less literal. I think one of the great crippling natures of my codependence was being very literal about everything. And, which really reinforced a lot of black and white thinking. And so the world was stripped of colors and textures and patterns and flavor and, and wonder because I just kept on becoming more and more of, you know, a daguerreotype. It was like this, this black and white picture to me. And, um, and that's not how life is. And uh, so when I, when I started to work in the steps, you know, she came, we came to our second step, and she said, now, how do you think that you're alive after listening to your story? Because when I talked to her, when I asked her to be my sponsor, she, um, she uh, had um, asked me to tell my life story. And so she said, now, when you, between 
eight and 10, I attempted suicide like three times. And, you know, for some reason, my body just kept throwing this stuff up. So, you know, mummy had a cabinet full of whatever, and there certainly was liquor in the house. And so I tried to off myself three times, and she said to me, now, how do you think you survived that? And restoration to sanity started to come to me because it was that I had an experience of a power greater than myself that restored me to sanity for quite a while before I ever found you guys and heard your stories about how, how this works. And then when, when um, the third step came around, there is this bit out of the 12 and 12 blurb that talks about a sustained and personal exertion. And it had nothing to do with, you know, somebody else's God, some prescribed spiritual practice from out there. It had to do with my personal exertion. What was, what was a life-affirming thing that I would do? And finding my way to the rooms of Al-Anon was life-affirming. It was completely anathema. I know, Franny. This boring Al-Anon speaks. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, there, there were a lot of wonderful things that uh, the step started to reveal to me and some really dark hard stuff. And you know, in uh, the essays, in the fourth step essay and out of the big book essay, talk, uh, talking about, it talks about, you know, we have these nooks and crannies that we can't always find in our first, you know, viewing, because our light doesn't quite get to those nooks and crannies. And, and, and it's really just a, a description of my own denial about, you know, m my shortcomings. And so what I, what I recognized was that over time, learning in al business meetings and sitting with, in meetings in general, I learned something about being patient with myself by being patient with others. And there was that thing about, oh, this is what service does. It's a tool that l teaches me how to be patient with myself, how to be self-respectful, how to be nurturing to myself by being nurturing, taking the focus off my energy-sucking, uh, oxygen-pulling um, me, 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 to like focus outward a little bit, to like put the focus on myself by being by learning how to focus outwardly, and it, it, you know, again, it's the paradox of this recovery. It's you know, there's. There are so many twists about how this actually works that it can only really be a spiritual practice. It's, it is not anything that I could, like, have a, like, you know how back in grammar school, maybe not, but, like, I was learned how to, I, I was taught how to diagram sentences, and I can't diagram this recovery because it is the way it feels that is the important thing for me now. Um, and so eventually we did get to the 12th step and, but not without doing the, uh, oh, the, the heart wrenching, um, amend stuff after the, you know, it's like, but I was put upon, I was the victim. I was the, this, I was the, that I was always in effect of somebody else. I had no affect myself. And this was an opportunity to clear that out. And it took me years and, and slow, what we call trudging, which really means a deliberate step. Um, because I remember trudging through those New York winters, man. That was, that was trudging. That's a deliberate step. Um, the, um, when I started to understand that it just was going to take time because I needed to learn many things about self-care, I needed to learn a with myself. Then I needed to learn self-care in my relationships because how many times did I, you know, let somebody else order my ice cream for me as opposed to my s getting what I wanted? How, how are my needs being taken care of in these relationships? And recently a, a, a former sponsee of mine um, moved way far away and he found a sponsor and, and I fell in love when he said, the first thing she asked me was, does, do you have to feed it or does it get to feed you too? And, 
And so there's that, that piece about looking after myself in relationships. And, you know, just recently I went through kind of a rough skid um, emotionally. I'm given to depression, as many of us can be. And, um, and something came up for me recently uh, that I could have only recognized had I been following this, this process uh, pretty closely with sponsees and, of course, a sponsor. And um, the, uh, the thing that, is, that, that came up for me was I hit this, this rough place because I had just gotten back from a wonderful vacation where I had this beautiful little wonderful romance with this guy and all of a sudden it realized after 20 years of being closed off to like letting my heart be open because it had been trampled on a couple times that you know there were there was you know jacked up sleep patterns from jet lag there was some you know I could run all over where I was vacationing in um, and it didn't bother me that I was eating every carbohydrate in the planet um, but <laughs> But when I got back here and got back on Muni and had this jacked up sleep thing, well, of course I was going to hit the skids. And of course I was going to get needy. And of course I wasn't, you know, I, you know I, I had to get, you know, that piece out of more about alcoholism where it talks about, you know, it doesn't matter what you know about yourself. It's what you do to pull your hand away as if from a hot flame. And I was like jumping in on the hot flame. I was, I was circling the rim of the funnel, so fortunately, because of what you've taught me, I, I didn't go down into the funnel, um, and I didn't, in, you know, because depression is an easy go-to for me. It's, oh, I know that way. Um, and, and I just didn't, I, I didn't go that way, but, you know, I got on Muni, and I didn't asshole it up, you know, with whatever was going on on Muni. Uh, I did say my prayers on the way to work. I did have a meditation um, when, it was, when it was important. And I did talk my ugly little neediness to the people I felt needy around. Um, and fortunately, as this, as this uh, process has moved through, um, I don't tend to get into those needy, depressive places so much, but I'm, I'm getting a little better at asking for the help about it. It's not easy for me to say, I need your help. It's, it's getting easier for me to say, yes, I'm depressed. But it's not so easy to ask for help. And, and um, I'm expecting you to clairvoyantly know. <laughs> Imagine. Um, so in any case, um, the, the thing that I think I uh, most appreciate about uh, the 12 steps is the, um, the, the piece about the connectedness that we get. Now, this is fellowship. What we do in these rooms is all fellowship. What I do with my sponsor, who, by the way, is I'm, I get to see her today, and I get to see my sponsees today. Um, the, um, what, what I uh, get out of the eye-to-eye -eye contact um, is starting to understand the importance of where I end and you begin. That's something that, again, I didn't come wired for. Um, the importance of eye-to-eye -eye contact that isn't about the currency of the day, which is, you know, texting through a feeling. Because as, you know, I've come to understand, um, you know, even in a phone call, 48% of that communication is gone because I'm not seeing you. And I don't know a lot about relationships and dating and all that kind of stuff, but what I do know, I've learned here. Um, and I'm getting way much better at it. And I'm getting um, uh, that piece that happens when I go to make an amends for something or have 10th step experience uh, of, of you know, going over my day and going, oh, I got to acknowledge something with somebody. It's fine. Like, you know, I was just talking about this depression I hit. I, I went into work that morning after waking up sobbing, and, and, and I didn't know what the source of it was yet, um, but I just went into work because I, I, I knew I needed to be in motion instead of just, like, soaking in it. And uh, I went into work, and I just told my coworkers, listen, 
it was a rough morning. I'm in a really weird place, and all I need to do is wait on somebody at the store. And it really helps. And they were like, oh, yeah, we know that. You know, it was a couple of wonderful women that I work with. Again, the women in my life. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, these are the things that don't come naturally to me. I mean, um, uh, not to spill too much family tea, but um, one of my coworkers' daughters uh, just uh, came out of rehab for the last four months where she had to go court remanded by way of uh, DUI. And, um, and it was really interesting to watch how I was through her when she came into the store yesterday because she's fresh out. And I averted my eyes all the time. And being with a sponsor or a sponsee, I look you straight in the eyes and I talk about what's going on. And, and sometimes what I learned, especially during the epidemic, was the bearing witness thing is so important to what we do here. It isn't, I don't have a solution because for you necessarily, I just know that I have these freedoms from working these steps and the promises for each one of these steps is coming true in my life every day more and more. But you're going to have your own. And all, my, all I do is sit and bear witness to that. And that's all I need to do. And, you know, I don't chase my sponsees around, although I broke out in, in chasing one around this week. But um, <laughs> in general, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, I'm not going to, I don't go giving help where it's not asked for. I don't thrust myself upon people to sponsor them. Um, and, and this is, I need that person to say, I need help. And because I know that's what was really important for my first step, that I needed to say, I need help. And every day I have to face that, especially around things like people, places, and things, and my first thought, and, well, y'all have your own hit list. But, um, you know, as I said, uh, one of the things that um, went on with me was a real developing of a self-destructiveness because of how unsure I was about myself and how lacking in a sense of center I was in myself. And so my current sponsor and I, when we started working together, she asked me, what does the word equanimity mean to you? And, and I was like, got me, I have no idea. Um, I knew what it meant, but you know, I, had to, I had to really feel about this and I had to read about like what the Sufis wrote about it or you know, what, what the Christians wrote about it or what Miriam Webster wrote about it or, or how you know, the Pharisees wrote about it or you know, the Book of Mystics or the Book of the Dead talked about it. And, and, and finally, I, I, I started to recognize that it was really just my capacity to hold my center in the midst of a storm. And, and, you know, that is not a natural thing for me. A natural thing for me, given the trajectory of how I grew up, you know, by the way, the trajectory of how I grew up did not mean that I'd be in these rooms, but it also didn't mean that I'd be throwing myself under the bus with, you know, people who would abuse me either. Um, it's just that's the way it worked out. But, but you know, the, 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 being, the learning how to be self-caring in, in my life has been an enormously heavy burden for me to unshackle myself from all my old beliefs. And, you know, in, in, in the uh, How It Works, it talks about um, some of us have tried to hold on to our old beliefs, uh, uh, have tried to hold on old ideas, and, uh, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. And, you know, that's everything. You know, there's, there's this piece in, that I've gotten out of recovery that has been so much about um, nothing changes if nothing changes. And you see, I'm not so disconnected that I can change one thing over here and the other parts don't need to change because as I've come together and, and grown up and matured inside of these uh, the work that I do with sponsees and sponsor, listen to you and tell, you're telling me how it works and how it doesn't work, that I've started to understand that I've started to rework myself into a different shape puzzle piece. And the puzzle piece lets other people change their puzzle piece. And one of the most difficult relationships and a, one that really shaped 
uh, difficult relationship with men was the one with my father. And, uh, you know, he was a closeted gay man who was very uh, great dad to me and as good a f husband to my mother as he could be. And, um, it, but it was difficult. It was full of secrets. It was full of, it was full of all kinds of, well, for lack of a better way of saying it, do as I say, not as I do. And, you know, when I came out to him, it was rough. He was rough with me. And as the last couple of years have shown, actually the last 30 years, because he was outed to me about 30 years ago in a bar in New York where I was drinking. And, um, <laughs> and, and he, uh, he was outed to me. And it was a, a bit out of, you know, I don't know what the motivation, on, but what it sounded like to me was that he, you know, the guy said, well, your, your father just broke up with my best friend. And I was like, who's your best friend? And, 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 and uh, it was this guy. And he had just described everything about our lives, the house, where my mother was over the summers. I mean, so this guy had some bead on what was real. And then when my father, three months after my mother died uh, two and a half years ago, comes out to us, he comes out here to go on a trip that my mother had planned for my uh, sister who lives here too and him to go up to Alaska. And um, so, uh, you know, he came out to us. Maybe He didn't use the G word, but he had a man in his life, and he was talking about him. And, you know, it took an enormous amount. I'm, I'm really grateful for, you know, that piece that I talk about, being self-forgiving by learning how to be forgiving of others. You know, this was a huge one for me. And everybody has their huge one. You know, they're, they're like, it's going to break me if this happens. And um, thank you, Dan. Um, you know, there's this, uh, this piece of my father and me that we're so alike. We have so much. There, there is, I mean, my sponsor's sitting here, and she spent a lot of time with him, and she's like, uh-huh. <laughs> and and um, we're so alike. And yet I, I, I was a lot like my mom, too. But I'm not either one of them. I'm, I'm my own thing. And, and this is one of the gifts of the program that, that I can immediately give you right now. You know, when I was getting ready for coming here and being with you uh, about this amazing miracle, which is working the steps and coming out at the other end of it, um, and then working them again, um, and maybe growing something called civilization inside of yourself, as it certainly was something that I needed to grow inside of myself, uh, the, um, the thing that I, 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 you know, it may seem like I'm kind of all over the map because I am, but the thing is that I couldn't, I just had to let God do this. And, um, you know, later in my recovery, uh, from about 10 years of Al-Anon and seven years of staying sober, I started to get kind of cute and casual with this gift. And I started to throw myself around in a post-traumatic, you know, after, you know, that, that emotional hangover after, you know, I stopped counting when 89 of my friends had died. And I was just like, you know, sucking it up. And so I just started throwing myself around angrily as if I didn't matter. I was hugely angry. And I had lost track of the steps and I had lost track of my books, and I didn't have a sponsor or sponsees. And I, you know, I drop into a meeting whether I needed it or not. My codependence started growing exponentially. And so by the time I was 13 years sober and 16 years in Al Anon, I became HIV positive. And I was, you know, 20 years practiced at not doing that. And when my uh, doctor gave me that diagnosis, it was like, you know that, well, I, I, when I get a fever, I get like this really weird vision, and it's like my head, the, my eyes go through the back of my head, and the depth of the room becomes huge. It's like a little doctor's office looks about as deep as this room is. And, um, and I was like, oh, my God, I need to go back to meetings. I need people to see me again. I need people to hear me again. I need to hear them. I need to see them. Because what I've learned by doing this is that I'm a social creature. 
And I have been put here in a family of four children. I had amazing parenting. I had incredible opportunities laid at my feet, and yet I stomped on them. And, you know, another one of those things, the traje trajectory of my life was, um, you know, I, I had, a friend of mine said to me, well, could you prosecute the guy? And I was like, why? I was there. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, it's, it, there's this thing that was still burning very much inside of me, being accountable to somebody. And I had learned by being accountable to my, my first AA sponsor, who's like, what is he, 64 now, 63? And he's 30, 35 years sober. I mean, it's amazing. And, and I just called him right up, and, I, and he said, get to a meeting. Don't drink and get to a meeting. And by the way, find somebody to do an, a, a fifth step with. Just write something out. And so I drove up to uh, Rio, Rio Nido near Guerneville and talked to one of the few people that I knew would actually, you know, because I had so detached from you that I just did a whole codependency and, and substance abuse fifth step with her. The substance was me. I was my qualifier. I finally realized I did not come here because of my parents. I, became, I came here because of me, my own behavior. And that ranges everywhere from, you know, the way I found myself, you know, on acupuncturists' tables going, oh, child, you had a drink last night, and to waking up in puddles from, you know, from, from uh, you know, walking in a blackout and taking a slide into, you know, an ice puddle in Boston's uh, Copley Square. And, you know, if there are any newcomers here today, are there any newcomers here today? Elanon NAA? Well, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> you don't have to do any of the stuff that hurts you ever again, even if you want to. You never have to do that again. You just saddle up to someone who's kind and, and sees you, and you can sit across the table from each other and see each other once a week, talk to each other, you know, learn in your little spats that you have with someone who's trying to give you a suggestion, that you work things out. This is what is what we do here. It's, it's working it out. It's not turning your back on it like I did. You don't have to do it by, like, causing great havoc, which is, you know, I live on the shoulders of great suffering right now. First with the steps, and then with the, the drugs that I take to keep me alive. And, um, and so the, uh, what, I, what I would really hope for you is um, this piece that's called The al -Anon Promises. It's out of this wonderful book that is, uh, was published well after I discovered this amazing miracle of a program. And um, it is in uh, From Survival to Recovery. It's a great book. Now, I work with my Al-Anon sponsees, uh, not only out of the big book in the 12 and 12, but also out of Paths to Recovery, um, because it has these wonderful essays about people's experience with the step. And then it also has these questions at the end of each of these steps and the traditions. The traditions were one of those things that I used to become a civilized human being again. You know, yeah, they're for the group conscience and all that kind of stuff. And, but, you know, if I start really personalizing these things, there's a lot in these things that teach me about taking care of myself. Um, but this is what the, it's on page 267 in this edition, 269 in the first edition. And uh, if we willingly surrender ourselves to the spiritual discipline of the 12 steps, our lives can be transformed. We can become mature, responsible individuals with a great capacity for joy, fulfillment, and wonder. Though we will never be perfect, continued spiritual progress can reveal to us an, our enormous potential. Many of us have discovered what our fellow members already know, that we are both worthy of love and of loving. We learn to love others without losing ourselves, and we accept love in return. Our sight, once clouded and distorted, can clear enough for us to perceive reality and recognize truth. Courage and fellowship replace fear. 
it becomes possible for us to risk failure and develop new, previously hidden talents. Our lives, no matter how battered and degraded, will offer hope to share with others. We begin to feel and know the vastness of our emotions without being enslaved by them. Our secrets no longer have us, no longer have to bind us in shame. As we gain the ability to forgive ourselves, our families, and the world, our choices expand. With dignity, we stand for ourselves without standing against others. Serenity and peace will have new meaning as we allow our lives and the lives of those we love to flow day by day with God's ease, balance, and grace. No longer terrified, we discover that we are free to delight in life's paradox, mystery, and awe. We laugh more. Faith replaces fear and gratitude comes naturally as we realize that our higher power is doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Can we really grow to such proportions? As we accept life as a continuing process of maturation and evolution toward wholeness, we gradually begin to notice these changes. We may see them first in those we, who walk beside us. Sometimes these changes happen slowly or haltingly, and occasionally in great bursts of brilliance. As we work the steps, we move ever closer toward light, toward health, and toward the higher power of our understanding. As we watch others grow, we realize we are also changing. Will we ever arrive? Will we feel joy all the time? Can we really be free of all cruelty, tragedy, and injustice? Probably not. But we can acquire growing acceptance of our human fallibility as, we, as well as greater love and tolerance of each other. Self-pity, resentment, rage, and, re and depression can fade into memory. A sense of community rather than loneliness defines our lives. We come to know that we belong, we are welcome, and we have something to contribute, and that is enough. And with that, I wish you a long, slow recovery. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. 